Well, welcome, Nicole. Uh, this is a Keaholi, Sustaina Keaholi Center for Sustainability's Community Connection. And most of you are used to seeing Tara, and I am the executive director, Candy Ellsworth. So this is my first um, Community Connection posting, and uh, Tara is busy today. So, um, but I have Nicole Lowen here today. So I, we are going to talk about um, the state legislature and, and how COVID uh, affected the process this year or how it affected Nicole personally, how it affected our county that she represents. And uh, so welcome, Nicole. Thank you. Thanks, Candy. Thanks for inviting me to be on here. It's a pleasure to be here. Um, and yeah, my name is Nicole Lowen. I'm a state representative for House District 6. So that includes the area from um, a little bit north of Kona Airport down to um, almost to the White Sands area, basically includes Hulualoa. And um, yeah, we, like everyone, like all businesses, all activities in the state were definitely affected by the pandemic and it changed um, our plans. We had to adapt. So do you want me to, do you want, do you have specific questions or do you want me to just go ahead and keep talking? Oh, um, no, sure. You know, so what, you know, I wanted you to introduce yourself, um, who you are, where do you work? Um, so mostly you're here, but you do fly back and forth to Oahu. So you mm -hmm. have, um, it, well, we can talk about that later as we go on your role. Um, and just what are some of the challenges that you faced um, at work due to COVID? which I guess some of that would be traveling back and forth. So in the beginning um, mm -hmm. of the legislative process and sessions, were they delayed? So the legislature begins every year on the third Wednesday in January. And so it began this year the same as usual. And I think by February, it was starting to, um, you know, make the news more often. We were hearing about COVID. We're starting to think maybe we need to worry about this. Um, and then in mid-March, I believe, we um, made the decision because there was a positive case at the Capitol, a senator that tested positive, we made the case, uh, made the decision to suspend the legislative session, you know, basically right in the middle. Um, and, um, you know, I think now that we've, we're further along in this, there's a better idea of, okay, one positive test, well, you can isolate the person and make sure everyone's been practicing good hygiene um and do contact tracing and so it doesn't mean one positive case doesn't mean shutting everything down all the way but back in march we still weren't sure so we suspended session um and basically just had to wait and see so everything was kind of put on hold and in the meantime we started to see massive impacts um to the state's economy which really changed I think, you know, the, the bills that we had been considering back in January, it became evident by March, April, May, that there was going to be a whole different set of issues we were going to have to be talking about when we came back and that, um, you know, some of the things we've been talking about doing that maybe cost additional money to implement new programs or create new positions were likely not going to be possible because of the um, impacts to the state revenues because of not having tourists come. Um, so yeah, we were out of session for a while. And then I think in mid um, May, I believe, we came back for a, a quick session. We re readjourned, came back for about a week, 10 days. And that um, we didn't take up any bills, uh, like subject matter bills on different policy matters, et cetera. At that time, we just shifted some things around to basically plug the holes in the state budget um, and address some really urgent matters. And then we recessed again and then we came back again in mid-June. And this was at a point where the state had been having very low case counts. Um, the in trial and quarantine, I think, had just been lifted and the reopening had just been, you know, started being discussed. So we came back at that time. We implemented a whole new set of protocols for the state building. So now instead of having open entry, you come in, you do a temperature check, you get a wristband that shows <laughs> you've been <laughs> cleared to go through. And then, um, and then at that time we came back, we were able to pick up some bills um, and pass some kind of policy matters. But for the most part, the focus of that, um, the ending out the legislative session was implementing a spending plan for the CARES Act funds. Um, mm. And 
the main focus was on pandemic relief and recovery and um, taking the steps we needed to do, you know, what we're able to do. We wish we could do more, I think. And then we did finally um, recess the session on July 10th. So throughout all that too, we, we implemented um, new procedures we've never done before to enable um, like committee members to participate remotely, basically by, by Zoom or, um, I don't know if we <laughs> use Zoom or a different platform, but similar idea. And then we even enabled remote participation in floor sessions so that some people who either were, um, you know, higher risk individuals mm -hmm. or were unable to travel for whatever reason were able to participate and even vote remotely through like mm -hmm. a Zoom platform like we're on right now. Um, mm -hmm. We weren't able to do, we, we accepted written testimony from the public. We weren't able to do in-person testimony. Um, and I think part of the reason for that is that um, they're still figuring out the procedures to sort of open it up to so many people. It really does require like a bigger amount of bandwidth if you're gonna have many, many testifiers who wanna start um, logging in. But I think the exciting shift it did bring is that really, you know, we've, I've been trying and some of my colleagues have been trying for a long time to, um, to make remote testimony possible which would allow for neighbor yeah. island residents to really participate in the legislative process. I mean, especially important when it's like a specific issue. I mean, I remember um, years ago, I worked a lot on um, some issues with coffee farmers, for example. It's like very specific Hawaii Island issues as coffee berry borer beetle, stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And um, the actual individuals that were most affected, if they wanted to come over and testify in person, which really is more effective than just written testimony, um, you know, they would have to fly over on short notice, get a hotel room, rent a car, figure all that stuff out. So it just like feels very unfair. Um, so yeah, I think that this, um, so wait, maybe one of the silver linings to come out of this is that it's really shown, opened the eyes of a lot of my colleagues um, that this is possible. And I think even more broadly on a, you know, global scale or national scale, this technology is going to start being developed by leaps and bounds. And, and I think we're mm -hmm. gonna see all kinds of new options come on the market for this kind of thing. So, so that, you know, that's an exciting, um, I, like if there's a silver lining coming out of it, it might be that we'll, we'll finally be able to implement remote testimony and have better participation from neighbor island members. Well, you know, we, we found that here at Keoholi uh, Center for Sustainability, we've, um, We've had some issues when, when we apply for grant funding or, or some things require a wet signature. In Hawaii, that's really difficult because you have to, um, some of it, like our, the GIA funding that you helped us with, has to be delivered to the state capital and it can't be faxed or scanned or, you know, we had to get a courier or we had to fly over there and a lot of organizations on on the different neighboring islands have had to deal with that for years. And, um, you know, it really does, it, it really does bring home the, the fact that, you know, when you are working towards sustainability, you know, uh, when you are thinking about the jet fuel that it costs to travel for 30 minutes to a neighboring island when you could have just sent an email, um, it's, I, I think this, it, that is a silver lining, definitely. Yeah, and some of those processes just seem so outdated, right? Like, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I mean, I'm gonna alienate someone, I'm sure, but like, who has a fax machine <laughs> anymore? Just, I know, yeah. I mean, the idea, and then the idea that you need to drop something off in person or that somehow it's more secure or more valid that way. I mean, there's, I guess security issues surrounding both processes, but there's not inherently that one is more or less secure than the other. It's just about moving forward and in embracing the new technology. And definitely, and hum, you know, islands, island sustainability for sure. I mean, we're an island state, and we're not just an island state. We're pretty far away from the, um, other places. So, how often do you do you have to go to um, Washington D.C. very often on a normal basis outside of COVID? Oh well, not Washington D.C. like ever mm -hmm. necessarily, unless I was going okay. to a conference or not. Because I well, no, because I mean I'm elected to the state legislature, so the state capital yeah. is Honolulu. Yeah. Um, you know, but you've gone Congress there for a few times since I've known you. But you know. 
Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I, there's been like different conferences that have been held there that I would have mm -hmm. that I would have gone to attend. Um, and there's conferences in other parts of the mainland as well. Of course, we're not none mm -hmm. of that travel is happening now. But as far as actual, you know, in for for working in my office, etc., it's just been back and forth between Kona and Honolulu. Um, mm. And that's been happening a lot, lot less now, of course. Um, yeah. I've mostly been back home in Kona. I'm actually in Honolulu right now for the first time since, um, I think, July 9th or 10th. And, um, yeah, it's a little bit, um, you know, when we when we went back to session in mid-May and flew then and the inter-island quarantine was still in effect, the airports were really empty and it felt relatively safe. I remember flying on the 4th of July weekend because we were in the middle of our reconvened session and things had just opened up and it was a mm -hmm. holiday weekend. So a lot of people were moving around and the airport um, was very crowded and that felt like very strange to be in a crowded place and <laughs> sort of not be able to really control how close you were to people. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, I'm trying to minimize as much as possible the amount of travel. So instead of maybe the back and forth every week, I'll just come over here once a month and try to fit meetings into, you know, a few days in a row. And that way I'm not, there's not so much back and forth. Mm -hmm. um, but you know, one of the challenges is, I mean, there's a lot of um, things we can do virtually now, but I think one of the challenges really is that, especially for politics, the interpersonal relationships are important. And there is something that, that, that is lost on some level that you can't, um, I don't think substitute with for Zoom. I feel like the one-on-one -on -one interactions can actually feel pretty interpersonal uh, on like a platform like Zoom, but um, the big group meetings, there's definitely a different dynamic. And you yeah. sort of think about, you know, when you meeting is over and someone clicks end meeting and then there's like this dead silence. <laughs> I'm sure you <laughs> have experienced that. Whereas like a normal, like in the real world, you would have yeah. a the meeting and then people would you know approach mm -hmm. someone after and say oh I had a question about this thing you said or there'd be some yeah I'll talk yeah. chit chat so there is some there's some things that that get lost and um in that platform that I think can be important to um mm -hmm. something like like politics and policy making where some of the relationships are so important mm -hmm. um but maybe we'll just have to figure out new maybe there's just a better platform that has to be developed that will enable some more of that <laughs> like lingering after a meeting making small talk kind of thing yes well obviously we're we're having uh, today normally uh, uh we stream this live at the same time on facebook and so um all of you on facebook will not see this until a few minutes after we're done but um and that is because we're using a different um computer than we normally use and wasn't able to stream and um, so yeah i've run into that myself with just i mean every single computer every single application is different even when you're using the same program um and it's really you know it's a learning curve also for older older folks you know um and in the county and state so it's it's uh my parents everyone <laughs> your parents yeah. are on the mainland yeah. they are family yeah. Yeah, yeah, we did a virtual birthday party for my dad just last week. So he yeah. was very, uh, he was pretty blown away by this technology, this all being possible, you know, to yeah. have all his yeah. kids and grandkids on the screen <laughs> at the same time. <laughs> Seemed very and, like science uh, fiction yeah. to him, I think. <laughs> yeah. yeah, we did a we did a talk story, you know, I think especially early on during the the shutdown, etc. There was just so many questions that people had and. We did a talk story. Um, we had scheduled a talk story for one night that that we hosted on Zoom and streamed live to Facebook, and mm -hmm. could not get it to work, um, and had to like delay it and actually do it the following night. And um, just got a lot of comments about that, like how can our how can these leaders not know how to use technology? <laughs> I mean, it turned out I think it was Zoom's had several updates since then. I think that they were still working mm -hmm. this stuff out, and we finally figured out. For whatever reason, it wouldn't work with any of our browsers, but it would work with like Microsoft Edge, which is a browser that mm. nobody uses. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's things that you know, I think people need to be forgiving with each other and learning new technology. Even if you're young and technologically adept, it's like there's just glitches that can't yes. be helped sometimes. So, 
Yeah. Um, I know what Kaholi Center for Sustainability is nonpartisan, and Nicole is running this year, um, but she's running um, uh, unopposed, and she's already our community um, representative and a community servant anyway in office. So um, we felt like, you know, this isn't a necessarily a plug, but I did talk to you earlier in the year when you were going for um, re-election and you had to have a list of signatures and they had to be, and you had to deliver them. And that was like right as COVID was happening and it was a very um, stressful time. So, and that was difficult as well to get all those personal signatures, right? When people are social distancing, yeah, we had stand orders. <laughs> yeah, it was a little bit different than Normally, it's pretty easy to get signatures. I mean, it wasn't it wasn't too hard. Yeah. It just took a it required a little more legwork because instead of going to like yeah. one community meeting where it was really easy <laughs> to do that, you had to kind of drive around to everybody's house individually and figure it out. And, yeah. But yeah, yeah, all those kind of things are. There's a lot of little things we don't think about as much. I think. Well, and um, so with the COVID in our community, is there any new innovations and uh, aside from the adaptations you've had to do personally that you see in our community that's happening or anything that you guys are um, working on now that you think will be um, a new innovation that's coming out of this COVID crisis? That's an interesting question. I mean, I think we've seen a lot of businesses shift um, from, you know, there's just been a shift in like delivery of services, right? Whether it's restaurants mm -hmm. or retail, um, probably a lot more stores are doing like the pickup and delivery options that, you know, so I think that those, those are ways businesses can adapt, I think. Um, mm -hmm. You know, I think that of course we've seen um, how being so dependent on one, you know, one sector, namely tourism for our economy, especially in West Hawaii, has made us a lot less resilient to um, the impacts of COVID-19. I think West Hawaii, because we are so heavily um, tourism dependent in our area specifically, has had like one of the highest unemployment rates. I know that's been a huge struggle um, for people. And you know, we deal with, with um, calls and emails every single day. Um, mm -hmm. And I'll take this opportunity right now to say I am not um, particularly proud of the way the state has dealt with the unemployment. I mean, to be fair, we were handed um, down funds federally that, you know, was an unexpected program that the states were supposed to stand up a whole new system and implement it really quickly. Um, you know, state governments aren't in any state notorious for moving quickly. Um, and uh, you know, in addition, especially with the PUA funds, there ended up being a huge amount of fraud that meant they had to put in place additional protections that made everything take longer on, on one hand. On the other hand, yeah. the idea that, um, you know, we can't just get enough people to answer the phone <laughs> to be able to talk to people and allay their concerns and explain what's going on, it's, it's really, really frustrating. So, um, you know, we've been trying to do our best for anyone who does reach out to try to help to connect them and help to solve those problems. Um, mm. But yeah, more broadly, I mean, I think that the catchphrase of the, you know, the, the these times over here is economic diversification. And there has been, um, you know, some funds already invested from the CARES Act spending in ways that we can look towards that and a lot of other discussions still happening. I think that um, it's something that we have always talked about and has long been recognized as something that's needed. But, um, you know, the economy really is like a moving train that's hard to you know jump off of or turn until something like this happens that you know in a certain way as a catalyst or a facilitator for change so hopefully you know we won't miss this opportunity to come back doing some things differently and investing in some other sectors of the economy that can help to um, bring back jobs that won't be so dependent on visitors coming here mm -hmm. and well, i know that's what you guys i mean with the keoholi center for sustainability that's part of the focus of what you guys are working on too, right? And having local businesses that are sustainable and provide jobs. So we're grateful yes. for that. Yes, and so, you know, we operate here at the Host Park, Hawaii's Ocean Science and Technology Park, and um, which is 
a state-run facility uh, run by the administration, NELHA. And we are a nonprofit, so we kind of represent all of it, which is over 50 different entities, researchers, people producing products, people doing research and development, working on conservation, um, working in food security, sustainable aquaculture, renewable energy innovation. And that was one of the, our, our main focuses was um, in, we worked through you uh, with your, in your team a couple of years ago to try and secure GIA funding, which we were able to secure. And, <laughs> and so that was one of the adaptations that we had to um, go through ourselves. So we were supposed to finish everything by the spring semester this year. And that was supposed to be in-person workshops for educators and students. And we had workshops scheduled and we had all this great fun stuff and innovative, you know, educational material. We had all this great workshop and then COVID. And so, <laughs> um, and then of course, teachers were scrambling for content when they were, when they came back and and realized that this was going to be a stay at home distance learning environment and it was very difficult. It was very difficult for the state, of course, but um, we, we ended up being able to finish those workshops, but through distance learning. So now we have, it kind of forced us, it was very frustrating at first, but it really put us in a better position because now we do have content that we can offer those educators and we're very thankful for that. And at the time, you know, um, it was, it became more charter schools, um, it, which was okay, but, but the Department of Education, the public schools are, you know, they came to the realization that, you know, we have a lot of, we have a lot of students at home that do not have internet access, that do not have a computer, that do not have access to, um, these resources and that's something we're going to have to deal with this fall correct mm -hmm. yeah oh i know the question of schools is obviously top of mind right now i think it's just such a difficult um mm -hmm. it's a challenging situation to figure out what the right approach is yeah, yeah. I don't envy the board of education having to to figure it out it's hard too because it's so it's also politically charged and then it's so different for every location. I mean, even the situation on Big Island versus Oahu is very different, so. Yeah, so um, the county is looking towards, I know they had a very large RFP, which is a, um, a grant funding opportunity that went out. And part of that was focused on, on broadband connection and services and trying to provide that to more of our communities on the island. So is that is that really, um, is that something that you guys are dedicated to in the near future? Um, yeah, I think part of that funding, you know, we gave the, the state had the, you know, initial control of the CARES Act funding, city and county of Honolulu, because, um, you know, cities or jurisdictions over a certain size got direct funding from the federal government as well, but that only went mm -hmm. to Honolulu. So we gave money to the counties for, for some of these things. So I think that that came out of, we allocated, I think for Hawaii County, it was 80 million. Mm -hmm. Um, and that one supposed to be, you know, directly for pandemic related um, actions. And so, yeah, I think expanding connectivity, um, you know, to more rural areas, making sure that students who do have to learn from home have the um, equipment that they need to do that. All of that is um, hopefully covered under, under that. And so, yes, absolutely. I mean, I think it's absolutely necessary um, if we're going to have online learning. I know that that even if schools do open in some capacity, it's certain to be like a hybrid, um, like for a limited number of days and there's still mm -hmm. gonna be a lot of online um, connections taking place. So it seems like to be um, in a household without a computer at all would be really challenging right now. I'd like to try to connect everyone as much as possible. Mm -hmm. Even to your own families. I mean, we have, um, a lot of our families have parts of their extended family that have moved to other places or came from other places or um so it's it's a challenging all around i'd say yeah. for you know education and and staying connected to family members and so um well with this 
COVID situation and in the, the educational programs that we did develop, you know, when you were talking about economic diversification, that's one of the things that you've helped us here, um, and you're very involved with NELHA as well, is trying to make people aware of these high-tech STEM careers that are available here um, in sustainable aquaculture and renewable energy innovation, and, and that students don't need to leave our island to find those opportunities, right? And, mm -hmm. um, and they don't necessarily have to do with tourism. And that's one of the really unique things about our island as an opportunity in science and technology is that we have this really um, niche area here at Nelha that we are able to do this. So, and I know I've talked with you before, you feel really lucky to be part of this community in West Hawaii and have that opportunity to represent that in the state. And um, I think it, you know, it's a, uh, it's, it's important for our young people to know that all of this is available here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, so thank you guys for like helping get the word out about that. But yeah, absolutely. I mean, having, Nelha is kind of a hidden gem. I mean, I think a lot of people still aren't that aware of it because, you know, it just looks like a road and some buildings. <laughs> like, <laughs> not, it's not like it's a, a cool theme beach. park. <laughs> yeah, you have to yeah. kind of go inside some of those yeah. buildings and that's what you guys are doing. I mean, you're providing people yeah that opportunity to look behind the curtain and see all the exciting mm -hmm. things that are happening down there. I mean, there really is, is so much. And um, yeah, I mean, that investment, that aquaculture piece is really unique to Hawaii because being an island in the middle of the ocean, far away from everyone, we really um, don't have a competitive advantage in a lot of fields because of our mm -hmm. isolation, et cetera, and the added expense that comes along with that. But, you know, we do have, uh, you know, pristine ocean surrounding us. Um, which is our kind of superpower. So Nell has one of the places mm -hmm. that's really taking advantage of that, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, it's like, you know, it's very tied to the past as well. You know, it's, uh, the population in Hawaii has always been great at utilizing their natural resources for island resiliency and, and island sustainability. So in the past, two of the greatest natural resources they had were sunlight and seawater and you know, now we're still using those two great resources, but in different ways um, to continue that. And so I think that's really great. And I, I, um, I hope our, our students and our young people here realize that there are other things that they can do beyond uh, tourism hospitality and that this is, this is a unique place. They don't need to leave our island because, you know, we need our bright young minds to stay here. We don't want them to leave. <laughs> we need them here to be inspired to help us. Um, mm -hmm. So I, I do think that's really important. And, um, and we're seeing that especially right now with um, the loss of the tourism industry. And so I thank you for always helping to support us here. And I know that in West Hawaii, you've been pushing for something as well as, um, is coming up with a certification. You know, uh, a lot of positions here require, well, they used to require, you know, a college degree, and they're not necessarily things that, you know, in sustainable aquaculture um, that people could do with an associate's degree or even a certificate. So that's something you've been working with, right? With Palamanui and the state and at I know, Yeah, I know it's been being worked on with them, with the Chamber of Commerce, and I've been part of some of those discussions. I can't take credit for doing the bulk of the work, but absolutely. I mean, I feel like, I guess a few things come to mind. Um, one is I've long, I've kind of long felt like there's really this inflation in education where um, the, the, certification and credentialism becomes like more and more and more. And even when the core skills of a job are often learned on the job, you need to go to school for eight years, you know, and get a master's degree before you're even allowed to, you know, get a foot in the door. It's not for really any practical reason, in my opinion, often it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a system that's kind of self-sustaining of higher education, et cetera. There's a, there's a lot of reasons behind it, but I mean, at some point, you can't just keep letting that inflation happen. At some point, that has to get rolled back to something that's more reasonable. I mean, people, mm -hmm. our grandparents, some of our parents, you know, you could have a 
high school degree and get like a decent, good paying job. Um, mm -hmm. And a college degree was, you know, you know, enough to be like a professional and, you know, a, go into well-respected fields. And now it just feels like that bar gets higher and higher. So mm -hmm. I sort of wonder if the, the impact of COVID, what the impact of COVID on higher education will be. Like, mm -hmm. how are these institutions going to, and you know, it's not just the credentialism, right? It's the, the, the inflation of the cost of it also. It sort of prices a lot of people yeah. out. Um, but I'm just not sh quite sure how there's, there be, some of the institutions are gonna be able to justify the tuition if they're not offering in-person experience. And mm -hmm. this could be an opportunity for that kind of a reset, you know? But, but on that note, yeah, there's a lot of jobs. I mean, I, I feel like in my personal life experience, a lot of, um, you know, most of the things I've learned that feel really useful or practical have been doing on stuff on the job. And school has a lot of value too, like go to school, <laughs> stay in school, study hard. Yeah. And I enjoy school, you know, I've always been a good student, but um, yes, um, the real stuff happens on the job. There is like, there's just this divide, I think sometimes between academics and um, mm -hmm. And practitioners, especially in like social sciences, I mean, I think in hard sciences, the academics feels also like partly what the practical work of it is, but with social sciences and some of this stuff, it's just, there's such a divide that, that it's mm -hmm. more about, mm -hmm. uh, I have to like trudge through these years of school and get this piece of paper so I can like go do what I want to do and then I can learn how to do it afterwards. So mm -hmm. something that we need to fix. And I think that having that, that kind of certification, I mean, we want to give kids who are, are excited um, mm -hmm. young people who are excited to do some of this work should have the opportunity and, and, you know, they should be, they shouldn't, they should be given the opportunity to, to learn how to do it and, and try it out and not, um, mm -hmm. be deterred by, I think, what some of the hoops that you're asked to jump through that, you know, might not even, the skills that you need to jump through those hoops might not even be very directly related to the actual skills that you'll need to perform a job well, so. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah, we have a lot of um, jobs here that are technologies that are just emerging. So some of them are things that you can't even go to school for yet. And so, and we have a lot of entrepreneurial opportunities and incub we have the Hatch Aquaculture Incubator. We have, you know, the um, Small Business Development Center and um, green, green Business Incubator. So you know, there are so many opportunities that don't necessarily require, you know, a four-year college degree or a master's degree or such. And that inflation that you're talking about, see, even just in the pool of applicants that even have a bachelor's degree, thousands of people, you know, applying for one job and they're all qualified. And then you have to go through all of that and, um, it's difficult. So, you know, um, especially, um, you know, I was a biology major. You, you studied biology as well. You, you went to school for some science, no? No, my undergrad degree was in history. And then oh, okay. urban, urban planning, yeah. <laughs> I, took bio, I took bio, I took like, you know, yeah, you had to take I something. I always think of you as You know, actually I didn't because I took AP biology in high school. So I don't know yeah. if I took, I think I took psychology in college, but I don't know if I took any hard sciences in college, actually. Yeah. Well, well, you know all about science and, and the ocean and, <laughs> and conservation, so. <laughs> and so you just learned an a lot of that on the job, so there you go. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, um, you do but, learn a lot on the job. Yeah. So we're hoping that happens eventually, you know, that there's, um, uh, that there's a certification process for like sustainable aquaculture or um, some of the different fields in solar, energy storage, you know, some of those positions that would be really great because as you know, some of those are happening so fast that, you know, we can't, this is, this is emerging technology that you know, if they were learning on the job, they would definitely have an edge, so, yeah. Yeah, what we've talked about doing, um, too, I mean, now everything that requires money from the state budget has kind of been axed for the time being while we wait and see what happens, but, you know, something that had been under discussion was looking at, looking at fields where we have a need, 
and then helping subsidize the cost of education for those fields for students. For example, teaching, you know, we've, we've long had an issue with the teacher shortage. And, you know, we find that even if teachers, you know, even if there's a span of time where teachers stay in the field before they leave and go on and do something else, um, mm -hmm. that, that span of time will be a lot longer for someone who's from here versus someone who, who came here from the mainland who doesn't end up staying that long. And so if we can train more teachers um, from Hawaii residents, then we'll be, do a better job filling that shortage. Well, one way of doing that would be to pay for their education. And so mm -hmm. I think that you could look at the same thing with some of the sciences. I mean, I know that like in Department of Land and Natural Resources, Department of Agriculture, et cetera, like mm -hmm. they always have a challenge finding um, people to fill some of these positions in hard sciences, especially from a local population. So I think subsidizing some of those degrees could be a, a way to go on that too. Definitely, yeah. Well, I, I might be dating myself, uh, but you know, when I was <laughs> when I was little, I remember a lot of times teachers that were going to school to become a teacher. Um, a lot of it was them working as an aide, and so you know, I like you're saying, working on the on the job you learn so much so can we supplement some of that education in just getting into the classroom right now because yeah. um we're, we're seeing a shortage of teachers and we're also seeing a huge shortage in i um was just aware that we had about 40 percent of our child care uh, businesses go out of business for for good and then the child care that we do have left um, their capacity has been cut because of social distancing and and COVID measures. So, you know, so we're facing this, you know, wanting to get a workforce back um, and then a lack of child care and what are we going to do with our young people in school? And then the argument of school should be about education and not child care. So there's, you know, so yeah, it's, I'm you know, if there could be a certification process for some of that, that would be really great. Mm -hmm. Because we could get, um, get everything, like you said, I look at the economy being a train, get it on track and moving with some momentum. So, um, yeah. well, is there anything, if anything else you want to like inform the, our audience about anything that you have, um an update or anything that you should think they should be aware of i guess i guess and um yeah like you said i don't want to make this i don't want to make this political so i hope it's not taken that way but i would say something that's really oh. relevant for everyone to think about is that um officially primary election day is august 8th but this year in yes. hawaii we are starting and we had planned this prior to the pandemic actually kind of fortuitously um we are doing a all vote by mail system so every registered voter should have been mailed a ballot to your mailbox. Um, follow the instructions carefully, because if you don't follow it carefully, it could invalidate your ballot. And then um, you can put it back in the mail, no stamps are required. Or you can drop it off at the West Hawaii Civic Center. Um, and there's also at the West Hawaii Civic Center, if you have um, questions or you didn't get a ballot or you want a new ballot because you changed your mind or anything like that, though there's the Voter Service Center open there every day except for Sunday, I think until 4.30 p.m. I want to say. So um, mm -hmm. yeah, just it's, it's that time of year. Everyone should make sure they <laughs> go vote. <laughs> and and um, yeah. that's a deadline, right? And you that deadline, so that was really interesting. I thought, you know, Oh, make sure you get you know registered to vote by the deadline. But now it's kind of been moved to a you can still register day of if you go to your voting. Yeah, it's a little bit right, right. It's a little confusing because they do have the deadline, and then mm -hmm. I guess you can't register to vote. I mean, this is sort of like the carryover. It's like a, a mashup of like different things getting added because we didn't used to have um, same day voter registration. That was. Mm -hmm. um, only available like since you know I think we passed a bill relatively recently in recent years to enable that um, like since I've been in office anyway I can't remember the exact year we passed it but um, so yeah that deadline is a deadline but now it's kind of not a hard deadline anymore because you can do same-day voter registration which I think initially was the day of election day but then since they've been having um, the early voting 
and which is now all mail voting, but there's the Voter Service Center open 10 days before the actual election day. So yeah, you can still go, I guess, register to vote at the, um, at the uh, Voter Service Center, which will be considered same day registration, even though they're doing it for the whole span of time, not just election day. So. Okay. And so also, if you're mailing in that ballot, you should mail it in by August 4th, right? Because it needs to be in the clerk's office by uh, the 8th. And if yeah. you don't get it in the mail by the 4th, they should, they can still deliver it to the West Hawaii Civic Center or wherever the voting. Um, yeah, you can is. drop it off at the West Hawaii Civic Center. Um, I think there's a voter, a ballot drop off box like at Yano Hall or somewhere south. I um, but otherwise it would mm -hmm. be there or the Civic Center. And yeah, it is received by date. So even if you postmarked it, if, you know, you want to make sure you give enough time for it to get through the mail and get where it needs to be. Um, okay. I think that in our ballot packets, it said mail by August 6th. I personally thought that was cutting it a little, little bit close. <laughs> yeah. um, so we'll have to talk to Office of Elections about that. <laughs> um, because it doesn't matter the yeah. postmark date, it's going to be the date that was received by the Office of Elections. So I personally well, I, just dropped, I went and dropped mine off in person. <laughs> yes, <laughs> well there. I know here, you know, just from experience, sometimes it's, you know, you mail something and uh, something something's coming from Hilo and the person says, I mailed it out, but it ends up going to Oahu and then back to Hilo and then, you know, Tacona and then, <laughs> so yeah. It's best yeah. to be safe in here, especially, yeah. <laughs> yeah, no, especially with COVID because there's fewer flights and, you know, I know at least early mm -hmm. on the mail was taking a lot longer. I had a package, mm -hmm. like I had a package from the mainland that my mom sent me that went through Guam before it <laughs> came here. <laughs> so I think now it's been back to normal, normal when you order online delivery kind of timeline. Yeah. But there was a point there yeah. where it was really slowed down. Yeah, yes, um, and uh, yeah, it definitely was kind of dicey there for a few months, and 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 really seeing seeing it and um, more because it seemed like we were all at home shopping online, <laughs> and then wondering when that was going to come, and it was taking forever. So yeah, um, we've we've all had some definitely learned all kinds of great new new things because of covid but yeah yeah so going forward um in session so you guys are are moving forward maybe looking for more funding opportunities and then also um ways to uh diversify uh the economy while trying to get everything back going right or are we i i feel like we were doing okay a few weeks ago and and you know shopping and going out to eat and all of a sudden there's there's been a little bit of a slowdown so we have a little bit of a community spread here but um so we're kind of pulling back a little bit and then hopefully that will is that what you're seeing for us um yeah i mean it's challenging and it's so challenging for businesses i mean even with the the relief that has come through it hasn't been ideal and um even i mean it's just I, th I know for a lot of these businesses that they're struggling to figure out like how long they can kind of wait it out at a certain point it's just mm -hmm. untenable so mm -hmm. yeah you know there's going to be changes and times are going to be a little bit rough you know so mm -hmm. I, I do think i mean big island numbers are still relatively low Today was again another record day. There was a hundred, over a hundred new cases, um, mm -hmm. mostly on Oahu. I think there was actually zero, I, zero for Hawaii Island known cases. I like to say because mm -hmm. um, that doesn't mean there's not there's zero. You know, it's just that there were zero positive mm -hmm. test results. Um, so, like, good job, Hawaii Island. You know, I think that it does um, help us to have a little more space and a little less density. Um, mm -hmm. Uh, but I think people are taking it seriously and being careful, which is important. Um, yeah, I just think for people who who aren't as financially affected as others, it's really time to think about how you can help out, like whether that's, you know, doing mm -hmm. a recurring donation to the food basket, which will do, you know, direct food relief to families who just need to make sure they have enough food on the table. 
um, mm -hmm. to, you know, do ordering takeout from a restaurant or trying to support local businesses. Um, I just think that there's so much more that we, I would like to be able to do. I mean, I think a lot of people turn to government and say, what, what why is a government doing more? I mm -hmm. mean, we really are trying to do what we can, but the state has been like similarly devastated with a loss in revenues um, with a drop off in yeah. tourism. So it's, it's hard to figure out how to fund all this stuff and we just keep um, hoping for more help from Washington. You know, I think it looked like mm -hmm. there was, there's things under consideration, so we'll see what happens. But, you know, even with the unemployment benefits, whether they get extended or don't get extended, et cetera, it's like there's still a lot of people who um, you know, for whatever reason, don't qualify for unemployment. Um, mm -hmm. And we don't want them to fall through the cracks either. So, Well, I know my husband and I went to the boardwalk in Kona, uh, Kailua, Kona, last night on Ali'i Drive. And it was really devastating to see all of the businesses that are gone. Some of them were our favorite, some of, a couple were my favorite stores. Um, restaurants gone, little shops gone. And it's, it was really sad. And we did, we went to a small restaurant down there that we wanted to help support because we were very excited they were still open. Um, and they were very thankful. But does, do you guys see this as an opportunity? The thing I was thinking as I was walking along there was, you know, we're, we're working towards, you know, we're looking towards climate change and rising ocean levels and becoming more resilient as an island. Um, but are we looking at this as an opportunity of possibly, okay, well, okay, these businesses are gone. How can we retrofit this, you know, with renewable energy or make strengthen this for you know we know that these are going to these shops are going to be affected by king tides and rising ocean levels so you know they were flooded years ago and that was devastating so can we use this as an opportunity to retrofit businesses and buildings and things like that yeah i mean i think it's time to start it's a good time to start thinking of all like throwing all the ideas on the table and talking about them right i mean it's kind of mm -hmm. like no one i mean it's hard because these big mm -hmm. changes mean on the other side of it like somebody's business is closing down somebody's losing their mm -hmm. livelihood i mean some of it's inevitable like a lot of those little stores on elite drive or the kona and boardwalk area a lot of them are sustained by like cruise ship um mm -hmm. passengers of which we have none now for a while so like that, that kind of change is inevitable. And, you know, do we expect to just go back to how it was? Were people happy with it, how it was? Or what could we envision differently? You know, could it be more of a, um, like historic area that that's maintained as like a site in and of itself? Could you, like you're saying, if we expect that the businesses on the ocean side of a lead drive are going to be um, especially impacted by um, impacts of climate change, like you know, should should we not look at re at continuing to have them there? Should there be like a more like something that often comes up is whether there should be like one way traffic on Elite Drive or should it be like pedestrian only pedestrian more often or more open to bike paths? So I mean, there's all these things and they all have pros and cons, um, mm -hmm. and a lot of that is actually that kind of thing down at that micro level is really. I would say more under the jurisdiction of county government than state government, but um, you know, it still is a bit of interest to me. I think it's important to have all those conversations. I don't know the right the right vision for the future, but maybe it's maybe it's time to go back to the table and do some kind of strategic re envisioning of like what you know what how do things change in light of COVID and this opportunity that mm -hmm. we have right now. Well, wonderful. Well, we're at the about the end of our session. So uh, do you have anything else you want to say? We get out and vote, get your ballot in the mail. <laughs> and, yeah, just, uh, I and mean, I, I think be kind to your neighbors and to each other. If you can figure out how you can help out, you know, feel free to reach out to my office. If you do need assistance with anything, we're really trying to you know, at least put out all the information to people and, you know, connect them to services where we can and try to keep people informed as much as possible because these are incredibly challenging times and um, yeah, it's not easy, but 
but we got to all stick together and help each other. Okay, well, wonderful. I'm sorry that we have interaction of uh, people asking questions, but we will post this on Facebook and people can give us our questions and we will, if, if you would like, we can forward them on to Nicole or she will go to our page and answer those questions and comments um, on the page. And uh, yeah, please comment with an aloha spirit and um, we're, we're all just trying to help. And so, well, thank you so much, Nicole. It was great thank hearing you. from you. And you know, good luck in Honolulu and stay safe and stay well. And we will see you next time you get back. All right. Great. Thank you so much.